Okay, so uh, welcome. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, I also want to thank um, uh, Roger Hertog for supporting the Hertog program. Uh, this is a research program. Um, some of the students in the program are in the audience tonight who are doing original research on the subject of religious violence and apocalyptic movements. Um, as you know, uh, many of you, the, this is a program where each summer we look at a different um, challenge. It's global in scope and transnational in nature. Uh, and so next year we're going to be looking at climate change. Um, but um, I'm particularly pleased to have Omer Bartov here tonight um, to address this subject of, of religious violence. Um, he is, uh, as many of you already know, um, one of the world's foremost authorities on the subject of the Holocaust and genocide um, more generally. Um, but he's much more than that. He's made uh, incredibly important contributions to our understanding of a whole range of, of subjects. Um, and as I think you'll probably hear tonight, some of it comes out of his own uh, background, his family background. And, and one of the things I just heard today that I hadn't thought of much before was how it is that um, he began working um, when he started out as an historian on the Wehrmacht. And uh, he points out that um, like a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, in fact, unlike a lot of scholars, um, in the 1970s and 80s, he was one who had performed military service himself in the Israeli Defense Forces. And it was, I think, and it makes sense, it was partly because of that training, that background, um, that he brought a knowledge of, uh, of military um, training, uh, regimentation, literally, um, that I think helped him uh, in, in that subject and helped many of us then to understand better that terrible history. Um, it was from there that he uh, began to work uh, more and more directly on the subject of, of the Holocaust. And in more recent years, um, I think he's really uh, help people to understand how it had a very different nature um, in Eastern Europe than it did in, in the West. Um, in many ways, that history was even more terrible than the history that was more familiar um, to people um, in an earlier period. So he's gone on and, and gone even deeper in looking at the, the history of particular communities. That's something we're going to hear about tonight. Um, and in fact, he's uh, begun to do the history of the long durée and looking at the history of this place over a period of, of centuries. And so, um, so I'm just delighted to, uh, to welcome him here. He's received many accolades. I won't bore you by, by naming all of them. I just want to uh, invite you to, um, to lend him a, a, a round of applause for coming here tonight and, uh, and addressing us. So thank you, Omer. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you all for um, coming here. Um, I will talk today about a um, project that I'm in the midst of writing. I've been researching it for a very long time, for about 16 years, uh, but I'm finally writing it up. Uh, and so what you will hear today is uh, a bit of a gist of it. Uh, it's very complex, and to make it even more complicated, uh, I will also be showing a large number of images. Uh, I will not speak directly about them, so you will try, I'm sure, both to listen to what I'm saying and to see the images and to make the connection. Uh, the book that I'm writing is uh, called uh, The Voice of Your Brother's Blood, Buchach, Biography of a Town, and the name of the book comes, as I'm sure you know, from Genesis, but I will read you the relevant passage. And God said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now, in spring 1944, the territories surrounding the small town of Buchach erupted into a wave of horrific violence. The German Wehrmacht forced a retreat from parts of eastern Galicia in March, counterattacked the following month, and drove back the Red Army. Buchach was back under German rule. For the next few months, this remote region of eastern Poland, now part of western Ukraine, became the scene of mayhem and devastation, cruelty and suffering. 
a last chaotic upheaval after three years of total war and genocide. The German security police regional outpost, assisted by local Ukrainian auxiliary units, continued to hunt down and murder Jews until it was finally dismantled. As the Gestapo vacated the scene, some local German officials, along with commanders of retreating combat units, protected the remnants of the Jewish population from local militias and roaming bandits, disbanded auxiliary police and murderous villages. Throughout the spring and into early summer, even as the Red Army and Wehrmacht were slaughtering each other, increasingly powerful Ukrainian nationalist forces undertook a vast ethnic cleansing operation against the Polish communities of the province. Here too, the retreating Germans helped save the Poles of the Eastern Territories, loading them into trains heading toward the relative safety of Poland's heartland. When the Soviets finally broke through the German lines in July 1944, they launched a massive liquidation operation geared to uproot the military and political Ukrainian nationalist organizations seen as collaborators with the German fascists and opponents of Soviet power. What the Jews perceived as liberation, many Ukrainians saw as reoccupation. The soil of eastern Galicia was soaked in blood. But who spilled the blood and for what reason remains open to interpretation, obfuscation, and distortion? Very little has been written on these last months of German occupation and early period of Soviet rule in Poland's eastern territories. Most German documents were destroyed, while Soviet records were inaccessible for many decades. Pamphlets by Polish and Ukrainian underground organizations are scattered in various archival holdings and provide fragmented and highly partisan information. But we do have numerous witness reports in diaries, letters, post-war testimonies, and judicial records. In fact, these personal perspectives offer an extraordinarily rich source of information for the entire war, complementing official records and enabling us to sketch a detailed picture of genocide on the local level. Historians have underused these accounts, viewing them both as too subjective and too painful. This has greatly impoverished our understanding of crucial aspects of World War II and the Holocaust. These are reports from hell on earth, where there was little room for pity and forgiveness. Yet they also contain moments of sacrifice, compassion, and humaneness. In June 1943, the Germans declared Buchach and the surrounding towns and villages Judenfrei, or clean of Jews. All Jews not employed on the few remaining agricultural farms and labor camps could be shot on sight. Many hid in peasants' homes, barns, and sheds. They had to pay a lot of money to the peasants who were hiding them, wrote Elias Schalfen, 17, in a testimony he deposited in the displaced persons camp of Leipheim, Germany, in November 1947. Those peasants went to town and shopped as they had never done before. This made things easy for the Ukrainian bandits who went straight to the houses that had been pointed out to them as hiding Jews and easily found their hiding places and would immediately execute them in the yard of the house. Denouncing Jews, he wrote, at the time reached unprecedented levels. The peasants themselves began murdering and chasing them out. Esther Grintal, 18 at the time, recalled in 1997 that when, quote, the Ukrainian militia passed through the forced labor farm where she had worked, she would, I'm quoting, hide in the toilet and count the shots, knowing by that 
how many people were killed. Later, Cossacks and others who had collaborated with the Germans appeared in the area and began murdering the Jews. They did not have enough guns, so they hanged people or killed them with axes, etc. They came to our camp with some collaborators from the village. They locked us up in an empty barn. They began beating us. They shot a line of people with one bullet, but the bullet didn't reach me. Again, I was put in a line, and again, the bullet didn't reach me. So they began killing people with knives. I was stabbed three times. The German army doctor who treated Grintal a few days later said, quote, what did the Ukrainian swine do to you? Pity and empathy were rare, though not entirely extinct sentiments during those dark times. They stood out precisely because they were no longer expected. More often, cruelty and betrayal dominated the experience of the hunted. Arya Klonitsky wrote in his diary in 1943, the hatred of the immediate surroundings knows no boundaries. Millions of Jews have been slaughtered and it is not yet satiated. He and his wife were denounced and murdered shortly thereafter. Joachim Minzer's diary contains references to, quote, executions in the prison yard being carried out mainly by Ukrainian policemen, especially by a certain Bandrovsky, who also liked to shoot people, sorry, Jews, on the street. Minzer was killed in 1943. Yoel Kat, 17, at the end of the war, vividly recalled many years later how the peasants surrounded this camp shouting, all the children out, we're going to kill you. Some were killed with axes, others put in a row and shot with a single bullet. He stresses, the Germans who came from the front protected us from the Ukrainians until the Russians arrived. Conflicting memories of rescue and betrayal reflect the chaos and vagaries of fortune at the time. Edja Spielberg Fleetman liberated at the age of 14, was hidden with her family by a poor farmer with a wife and four children. Later, she was denounced by a Ukrainian workmate. But the local German commander escorted Edja and her family to the Soviet lines, saying, I hope you all live well. She recalled that, quote, the Ukrainians were worse than the Germans, not least because in her estimation, 80% of a family were killed by the Ukrainians who were our friends. By that time, the Nazis had orchestrated the murder of the vast majority of the Jews in Galicia. But without these personal perspectives, we would have known close to nothing about this period. In 1948, Moise Spiegel, 49, testified that in January 1944, Ukrainian militiamen murdered most of the surviving 120 Jews on a farm where he worked, including his 14-year-old son. It is important to state, he emphasized, that this killing was not a German action, that it was performed by Ukrainian policemen and bandits. Most survivors of that massacre were butchered in yet another bandit attack. The child orphans stacked up in a pile, victims lying with open guts. The local German administrator had tried to protect his workers. When he left, says uh, um, Spiegel, the Jews earnestly cried. But his replacement, a young German army officer, said to them, as long as I'm here, nothing will happen to you. We do not know the name of this man, and our only source of information about him comes from the Jews he saved. A few hundred survivors converged on the town of Tuste, near Buchach, where the officer was stationed until the Red Army arrived. Most people think of the Holocaust as an event of industrial killing, symbolized by Auschwitz, a vast undertaking of streamlined, anonymous mass murder. In fact, half of the total victims of the final solution did not die in extermination camps. 
They were killed in their own homes and streets, cemeteries and synagogues, in nearby hills, forests and ravines. The killing was neither anonymous nor streamlined. The murderers often knew their victims by name and saw them face to face before they shot them. Their deaths were bloody, gruesome, and accompanied by many instances of gratuitous cruelty. The killers were not only German police and SS, or only Germans of any description, but also members of other ethnic groups from the victims' own regions and towns, often people they had known for years as classmates and colleagues and neighbors. There was nothing secret about these events. They were public, routine spectacles in which everyone played one role or another. In 2003, the Polish Yulia Mikhailivna Trembacz recalled the German crimes against the Jews, I'm quoting, how they buried them alive and how these people dug their own graves. She had a front row view. From the street where I lived, I could see how the ground was moving over the people who were not dead, who were still not dead. The Ukrainian Maria Mikhailivna Khvostenko remembered looking out of her classroom window and seeing, quote, a crowd going around the municipal hall toward the bridge surrounded by gendarmes with dogs, Gestapo, and militia who were hurrying toward the killing site. There were women, men, old people, and young, our schoolmates and friends. From the fall of 1942, to the end of 1943, she says, the Germans conducted roundups with terrifying regularity. They would arrive on Thursday evening and work all night. And the next day, as we hurried to school, we could see corpses of women, men, and children lying on the road. The Germans would throw infants from balconies onto the paved road. They were lying in the mud with smashed heads and spattered brains we could hear machine gun fire from the killing site. Perpetrator behavior is often explained as a consequence of dehumanization. The obstacle to the killing of innocents is removed by perceiving them as non-human. This view of mass murder allows us to avoid any discussion of the often ghastly encounter between the killers and the killed clearing the way for detached analyses of decision-making and the logistics of genocide. I have never bought into this argument, but in order to examine its veracity, I decided to investigate the Holocaust in an entirely different way, not from the prism of Berlin and not strictly through the eyes of either one side or the other. Instead, I chose to reconstruct the event in its entirety as it occurred in a single site. Selecting the site had to do with its representative value and the availability of sources. Eventually, I picked a town whose name was familiar, but about which I knew very little. Buchach was the hometown of Nobel Prize laureate Shmuel Yosef Agnon whose stories I had studied in school in Israel. It was also, as it happens, my mother's hometown, although I had no intention of writing a family history. I was intrigued, however, by the notion of writing a biography of a town, a history through the eyes of the protagonists. And in this sense, my personal link to Buchach clearly motivated me. The tension between analytical detachment and empathetic understanding was therefore built into this book from its very origins. No less than 60,000 Jews were murdered in the area of Buchach and Chortkov, a nearby town in which the security police outpost was based. Accompanied by mistresses and wives, children and parents, who came to enjoy the raw surroundings, these 20 to 30 policemen led a comfortable existence, captured on hundreds of photographs kept in West German 
court archives. They were ably assisted by up to 350 Ukrainian auxiliary policemen, along with local town and village gendarmes and Jewish policemen recruited and paid by the Jewish Council. From the local perspective, the Holocaust in Buchach was a series of extremely violent local roundups, assuming at times the character of communal massacres. About half of the approximately 10,000 victims were transported by train to the Berzhets extermination camp, where they were gassed. The other half were killed in situ. This reflected the fate of Eastern Galicia's 500,000 Jews as a whole. 250,000 were gassed in Berzhets, while the rest were shot next to where they lived. Most of this massive bloodletting was accomplished within 18 months in an area measuring less than half the size of the state of New York. For the Jews, Buchach was a shtetl, as were many other similar towns in Eastern Europe. This was a figment of Jewish law. Historically, the quaint shtetl featured in Mark Chagall's paintings and the stories of Sholem Aleichem never actually existed. The highest ratio of Jewish population in Buchach was reached in the latter part of the 19th century, when Jews constituted some two-thirds of the inhabitants, the rest being Poles and Ukrainians. On the eve of World War I, massive immigration caused by growing poverty had diminished the ratio of Jewish inhabitants to about half of the total. This was a characteristic pattern throughout Eastern Galicia, where rural Ukrainians constituted the majority of the population, while Poles and Jews dominated the towns and cities. The mix of populations meant that the German genocide of the Jews took place within a complex and increasingly hostile web of ethnic, religious, political, and national affiliations. In implementing the final solution throughout Europe, the Germans adapted with remarkable agility to, a, to vastly different local circumstances. Yet these circumstances largely determined the manner, speed, and scope of the killing, as well as its effects on the rest of the population. In studying the Holocaust on the local level, we discover that the category of bystanders becomes meaningless. When an invading power joins forces with local elements to murder a segment of the population, there are only degrees of engagement, ranging from full cooperation to utter rejection. Within that context, we can identify a prevalent gray zone. Some who hide the persecuted also denounce them. Some of the killers also shelter. Some of the collaborators turn to resistance. Claims of indifference or passivity appear absurd unless they encompass watching your neighbors being shot and then taking over their property. For some of those not targeted, genocide proved profitable. The Ukrainian gymnasium teacher Viktor Petrakevich wrote in his unpublished diary in January 1944 that while most people in Buchach were experiencing, quote, unprecedented destitution, some people who before the war were earning very little make fortunes, gaining more money than they would have ever dreamed of in the past. Where's Petrikevich? Here he is. The source of this new wealth soon became clear. As the Red Army came closer, he writes, many merchants, craftsmen, and so forth, who were living in houses that had formerly belonged to the Jews, began moving out. They anticipate Jewish revenge, he wrote. The Germans marched into lands with a long history of both coexistence and conflict. That history had little to do with the occupiers, yet by necessity, it played a part in the implementation of genocide. Even before World War I, 
Galicia had been a site of contestation between Poles and Ukrainians, whose origins can be traced back to the 1600s. Four centuries of Jewish settlement in the area also left a legacy of often uneasy relations and occasional outbursts of violence. The conduct of all local protagonists during World War II was therefore, in some measure, governed by collective memories and acquired perceptions and norms of behavior. In the book that I'm writing now, I try to explore the deep roots of local genocide, to reconstruct mass murder in a single site, and to examine competing post-war narratives in judicial discourse, memory, and commemoration. In that sense, this book is a collective biography in that it allows generations of Buchat residents to speak out. It is a schizophrenic biography in that these voices from the past often speak in very different registers about themselves and their neighbors. It is a representative biography in that it stands for an entire universe of similar towns and regions in Europe's eastern borderlands, a world that was wiped out and forgotten. The interest in that world cannot reside only in the manner and causes of its destruction. It was rich and varied by its own right. We know so little of it because the voices of the inhabitants have been silenced. By letting them speak again, I hope to exemplify the richness of what had been lost even as I investigate the reasons for the disaster. Because we conjure Buchach back to life, the tragedy of its assassination is better comprehended. It is difficult to mourn a life one never knew. It is harder to accept the loss of a life intimately shared. The final eruption of external and fraternal violence in World War II seemed to many both shocking and inevitable. But that is reading history backward. To be sure, there had been much talk about the need for the unmixing of incompatible peoples. But no one could have anticipated the scale and horror of what came to pass. Still, the question must be asked, why did such unprecedented and gruesome violence seem at the same time to be a natural outcome of past events? Was this a problem from hell, as was said about the genocide in 1990s Yugoslavia? an expression of endemic, unstoppable violence? Were the various ethnic groups just waiting for the right moment to leap at each other's throats? This view was as inaccurate of Yugoslavia as it is of towns such as Buchach. It implies that some societies are just prone to violence, and there is little that more civilized nations can do about it. Yet the fact of the matter is that while there was indeed internal potential an internal potential for violence, it was triggered by outside invaders, often representatives of those self-proclaimed higher civilizations whose goals, determined independently from those they occupied, could only be achieved by sword and blood. The province that came to be called Galicia following the Austrian annexation of southeastern Poland in 1772 had not experienced major outbreaks of violence since the early 18th century and was to remain relatively calm until World War I. And yet, when the Germans arrived on the scene in July 1941, they needed to do very little, at times nothing at all, to incite violence. It is this shift from coexistence to conflict that needs to be explained. In the book, I try to trace the roots of this precarious inter-ethnic balance from the very foundations of Buchach in the late Middle Ages to its final destruction. In doing so, 
I hope to recreate the widely diverging narratives of the past told by Poles, Ukrainians, and Jews throughout the intervening centuries. These starkly different stories about the town they shared were not necessarily antagonistic. Often, each group simply ignored the others as it wove its own tales of history and myth, memory and legend. Yet the very present and powerful underlying assertion of cultural, spiritual and material difference did end up creating a sense of an essential and unbridgeable divide between the groups. Some voices reach us with force and clarity from the more distant, opaque past. Nathan Hanover, who wrote a book called The Abyss of Despair, or translated into The Abyss of Despair, a vivid eyewitness account of the devastation wrought by Bogdan Khmelnytsky and his Cossacks in 1648 uprising against Polish rule, tells of the Polish and Jewish citizens of Buchach fighting side by side on the city's walls. The German tourist Ulrich von Verdum, who visited Buchach in 1672, wrote that despite its destruction by Ottoman troops, the town had been largely rebuilt, especially by the Jews, who are very numerous in this town. That year, the peace of Buchach was signed under the giant linden tree on a hill overlooking the town, where it still stands, between the Turkish Sultan and the Polish king. But only four years later, the French traveler François Paulard de Lérac reported that following more fighting, the Turks had accomplished a lasting destruction of Buchach. Yet the town was rebuilt once again. When de Lérac returned to it in 1684, he observed that the Ruthenian peasants had put up their shacks, quote, next to the gate of the city and under the guns of the castle while within it, the walls live only Jews and some Poles. This was to remain the demographic and occupational pattern for the next 200 years. The 18th century witnessed a period of peace and prosperity, ruled by the immensely rich and notoriously eccentric Mikowai Pototsky, a patron of, religi of religion and the arts, a womanizer, a drinker, and a brawler, Buchach gained its impressive town hall and monastery. It also experienced the arbitrary power of the grand Polish magnate. As the poet Zygmunt Krasinski wrote, Pototsky shot women on trees and baked Jews alive. Much of what we know about the early history of Buchach comes from an account published in 1882 by the priest and historian Sadok Baranch a fanatical Roman Catholic and devoted chronicler of Armenian origin. Many of the documents he cites were subsequently destroyed. Another ardent collector was the writer Agnon, whose sprawling posthumous account of Buchach overflows with tales of Hasidic rabbis and traitorous followers of the false messiah Shabtai Tzvi. Agnon's 18th century Buchach seems to have nothing in common with what Baranch writes, say, for their identical location. The Jewish Enlightenment, or Haskalah, which promoted modern education and greater social integration, promised to facilitate greater Jewish Christian integration. And indeed, some Askilim from Buchach ended up as university educated scholars, assimilationists, or Zionists. But by the 19th century, nationalism began to infiltrate people's lives, and with it came new criteria for distinguishing between one group and another. By the late 1800s, the central question was who does the town, the region, the state naturally and by right belong to? As Poles and Ukrainians grappled with each other over ownership of Galicia, the Jews, who could only shift alliances from one group to another, found themselves in an increasingly precarious no-man's land. 
Until World War I, the Habsburg Empire managed relations between ethnic national groups in Galicia relatively effectively. Heated rhetoric rarely transformed into physical violence. Instead, nationalism pushed for greater literacy and stimulated cultural activities, political engagement, and economic progress. All this changed dramatically in the Great War and the national ideological struggles that followed it. Little has been written on the effect of the fighting in the East on such ethnically mixed communities as Buchach. The devastation was on a scale not seen since the 17th century. Tens of thousands of soldiers were killed in close proximity to Buchach, which was occupied twice by the Russians and remained close to the front throughout much of the war. The Russian occupation brought with it murderous pogroms. The unpublished diary of Antoni Shevinsky, headmaster of the boys' school in Buchach and an anti-Semitic Polish nationalist, provides an unparalleled view of this town under the first Russian occupation. Just as Shevinsky fled from, uh, in the face of the second Russian offensive of summer 1916, the Russian Jewish soldier Abalev arrived in Buchach on the heels of a victorious Cossack unit. The town, he wrote, presented, quote, a terrifying picture of destruction, vandalism, and cruelty. He went on to describe the gruesome consequences of the pogrom that had just occurred there. S. Ansky, author known to many of you probably as author of the D-book, who visited Buchach in early 1917, described it as presenting, quote, the tragic scene of a dead city. Rare surviving Austrian and Russian documents and photographs of wartime Buchach confirm these impressions. The end of World War I did not, bring to Galicia, did not bring peace to Galicia. As the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed, Ukrainians and Poles began fighting over the province. In the course of the conflict, which the Poles quickly won, numerous Ukrainian atrocities against Polish civilians were widely reported. Meanwhile, a series of Polish pogroms against Jewish communities prompted the establishment of two international commissions of inquiry. Much of the anti-Jewish violence was linked to allegations that the Jews were taking the wrong side of the conflict, not taking any side at all, or professing Zionism. Whichever it was, the Jews clearly did not fit into the Polish or Ukrainian visions of a new nation state. Following yet another war, between Poland and Soviet Russia, these national, ideological, and inter-ethnic conflicts left a bitter legacy of resentment, suspicion, and rage. Ukrainian hopes to set up an independent state had been dashed as they found themselves under Polish rule. Polish attempts to colonize the region were met with violent Ukrainian resistance which led to increasingly oppressive policies. And Jewish aspirations to integrate into Poland encountered popular and official opposition. By the 1930s, Ukrainian nationalists were being trained in Nazi Germany. The Polish authorities were instituting anti-Semitic measures and growing numbers of young Jews drifted towards socialism and Zionism. A mass of police reports, political pamphlets, personal letters and diaries, and post-war memoirs reflect some of these trends in Buchach. The town remained politically and culturally vibrant throughout the interwar period. It had far more restaurants and hotels, cafes and bars than one can find there today. In fact, there's none there. No. Such figures as the historian of the Warsaw Ghetto, Immanuel Ringenblum, and the Nazi hunter, Shimon Wiesenthal, began their lives there. Yet the mood was growing darker. Agnon, who visited Buchach in 1930, saw a Jewish community in decline. Many were leaving, 
Communist Party cells were the only spaces where all three ethnic groups interacted without hindrance, but they had their own violent potential. Many younger Ukrainians were joining the increasingly radical organization of Ukrainian nationalists known as OUM. When the Soviets took over Galicia in 1939, a brief moment of acceleration and hope was followed by two years of political terror and economic collapse. Driven by suspicion of enemy nationalities, social classes, and integral nationalists, the Soviets deported tens of thousands of Poles, Jews, and Ukrainians. This was oppression on an entirely new scale, followed by the mass execution of mostly Ukrainian political prisoners just as the Germans march in in July 1941. The state-ordered murders greatly exacerbated inter-ethnic animosity and played into the hands of the invading Nazis, who were quick to blame them on the Jews. The ensuing massacres of Jewish populations can be traced back directly to Soviet policies and Nazi propaganda, though their deeper origins stretch back at least to World War I. As anti-Jewish violence became a daily routine in German-occupied Buchach, this community of increasingly fragile coexistence was transformed into a community of genocide. Not all protagonists conf conformed to the roles assigned to them in conventional accounts. If younger members of pre-war Ukrainian nationalist organizations became direct participants in Nazi extermination policies, older conservative Ukrainian political and religious leaders tried to prevent the violence. While pre-war Polish elites had supported the exclusion of Jews, they appear to have been more likely to shelter Jews than either their Ukrainian neighbors or Poles in the Polish heartland. If peasants clearly took part in the killing, Many Jewish survivors were hidden by poor peasants living on isolated farms who received little or no compensation. Finally, while the Jews were targeted as a group by the Germans, the Buchach police, the, the, the Buchach Jewish Council and police were notorious for their corruption and despised as tools of the Gestapo. Yet several policemen eventually joined the resistance. The final phase of the transformation of Buchach into a sorry, the final phase in the transformation of Buchach into a homogeneous community came with the return of the Soviets. On the basis of previously inaccessible documents, I can reconstruct the liquidation and deportation policies by the NKVD in 1944-49. While large numbers of Ukrainian fighters, along with their families, were sent to gulags or exiled to Kazakhstan, most of the surviving Poles were sent to Poland in a vast Polish-Ukrainian population exchange. The brutalization of the war years also left its marks. Investigations of the genocide of the Jews often culminated in summary justice. Jewish survivor René Zurov recalled in 1995 how as a little girl in recently liberated Buchach, she and her friends would go for our entertainment to our daily hangings of the horrible collaborators. We saw them strung up and I'd be in heaven. There was none of all these trials with witnesses. One would say, he did it, string him up. The inhabitants of contemporary Buchach are former Ukrainian residents and their descendants, villagers who moved into town after the war, and ethnic Ukrainians deported from Poland. Most know very little about their town's past. The communists had subsumed the genocide of the Jews under a general narrative of Soviet martyrdom and heroism. The new Western Ukrainian authorities have resurrected the nationalists of World War II as heroic figures, neglecting to mention 
their role in the destruction of the Polish and Jewish neighbors. Thus the fate of the Jews has remained outside the official narrative of the past. The survivors and exiles never forgot their hometown. Communities of memory around the world preserved their separate narratives and passed them on to their children. A memorial association in Wrocław has published a stream of personal accounts by Polish survivors. The former mayor of Buczacz put together a memorial book narrating the history of the town and region from the Ukrainian perspective. The densely written Jewish memorial book contains much valuable historical scholarship and personal testimonies, but almost nothing about the Christian inhabitants of the town. Material remains and sites of commemoration similarly reflect these split and often conflicting memories. On the Fedor Hill, where thousands of Jews were murdered, a large memorial to Ukrainian freedom fighters has been erected. On another hill, next to the famous linden tree, a new statue of Ukrainian nationalist leader Stepan Bandera overlooks the town. There are no memorials to the Polish population, although Buczacz is filled with edifices constructed under Polish and Habsburg rule. But the Roman Catholic Church was renovated by Father Ludwig Rutyna, who returned from decades of exile in Poland. Before his death in 2010, he had succeeded in making it into a modest new center of Roman Catholicism in a predominantly Greek Catholic region. There's some reason for why people adopted Roman Catholicism there, but we can talk about it later. Jewish life is not revived in Buczacz and attempts to commemorate the victims have been largely unsuccessful. A memorial put up by survivors in the Jewish cemetery immediately after the liberation was removed by the Soviet authorities. A small memorial stone to the victims on the Fedor Hill, which lay broken on the forest floor for decades, was put up again some years ago, but remains unmarked and difficult to find as are the mass graves of some 5,000 Jews surrounding it. A new and unassuming memorial in the Jewish cemetery is hidden from view and already crumbling, and seems to serve also as a public toilet. No information about the Jews of Buczacz is available in the town, save for a few photos of Agnon in the local museum. A plaque put up next to the author's former house does not mention his Jewish identity. He, he appears as a, as a Ukrainian writer. Thus the history of Buchach and its demise must be sought elsewhere. Dozens of archives in Russia, Ukraine, Austria, Germany, France, Britain, the United States, and Israel contain vast amounts of information written in nine languages on this little borderland town. German court records provide especially rich material on the period of the Holocaust, as do hundreds of written, audio taped, and videotaped testimonies of survivors stored in Poland, the United States, and Israel. Polish eyewitness reports of Soviet deportations are stored at the Hoover Institution. Interviews with scores of local Ukrainians, exiled Poles, and surviving Jews have proven to be a rich source for reconstructing the fraught inter-ethnic relations in the daily, and the daily life of genocide in Buczacz. In 1995, I interviewed my mother about her hometown, Buczacz. For the first time, she spoke about her childhood. And that conversation set me off on this long journey. We had planned to visit Buczacz together. She had not been there since leaving at the age of 11 in 1935. But not long after the interview, she fell ill and passed away in 1998. When I finally reached Buczacz, I was glad that my mother had not seen the erasure of memory so blatantly displayed there. But I'm sorry that she and so many other people with whom I spoke over the years about the town they loved and who recalled cherished memories of childhood in a pre-war world 
that seemed from a distance to have been an era of innocence on the eve of destruction will no longer be able to read this book that I'm finally trying to finish. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. So, I mean, my, my first question, it's, uh, maybe it has a long answer, but those images are just extraordinary. And uh, I, I wonder, you know, having myself uh, often had to search for images to illustrate a, a story uh, and, and barely coming up with anything like this. I mean, could you just describe like what it took for you for this part of your research? Um, it, it took several things. Um, yeah. I'll say one thing. Uh, um, a couple of days ago, I, I, I got an email from my uh, German research assistant, uh, mm -hmm. Frank Relka, who had seen some, um, um, on, on the internet, some lecture that I gave. And he said that he was so pleased to see these images, uh, and partly because he collected some of them for me. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, one thing is to have a really good research assistant mm -hmm. um, who is, uh, really um, knows the archives inside out. I found a fair number of them myself, but it just takes... Uh, many years, um, uh, an engagement with images, which I developed as I was doing this project. Um, I'm, I'm halfway through, through this project, I got to know uh, the, the late German author, Zebat, not personally, but his writing, and his use of images. And it spoke to me very much, so I became more and more interested. And so whenever I could, being in archives, speaking with people, um, Speaking, giving lectures, uh, I, I ended up with images. I'll give you just one example. I gave a talk uh, uh, in, in Melbourne at Monash U University. Uh, and this man came up to me after that and said, you know, my mother was in Buchach, and this is an elderly man, my mother was in Buchach in World War I as a doctor. Uh, and she was there just for the war. And later, after the, uh, the revolution, she went to Australia. In Australia, they never recognized her medical degree, and she n never worked as a doctor again. But she kept these photographs. And I asked, could I have them? So he gave me these photographs, and I use here some photographs which are from her collection. They don't exist in any archive whatsoever of the Russian Army Hospital in Buchach. So it's just because I gave a talk there, and this man came up to me. So what you find is that there's this little town, which is a dot on the map that nobody ever heard of if they didn't grow up in Israel, and even then they know nothing about it. They just heard the name. And you talk about it, and you start acquiring more and more both a lot of images and then a lot of other mm -hmm. things. And what about the, the other dots on the map? I mean, if you could help us, I mean, that's kind of part of, for, for me anyway, what makes it all so overwhelming is just the idea that that there are all these other, this is a medium-sized town, right? And, uh, um, and so when you look at the, um, uh, the larger context, um, can you give us some sense about what was un unusual and, and what was typical about this, especially in terms of the, um, I mean, for me, one, one of the things that's so extraordinary is this longer history of violence, right, that goes back m many decades yeah. before the Holocaust. And so, yeah. So, yeah, medium size, it depends how you <laughs> compare, what you compare it to, but it had, uh, um, let's say, 10,000, 8,000 inhabitants over time. In, in the 19th century, it grows uh, to about uh, uh, 15,000. Uh, on when the Germans come there uh, in 1941, there are about 8,000 Jews and 8,000 Poles and Ukrainians. So altogether, just over 15,000, which is about the population of the town today. Um, it's very similar to many other towns in the region. Um, there are, of course, differences. Um, uh, some are curious. So one difference is that uh, this is a, not a particularly hilly region, but Buchach is built um, in, in this valley of the Strepa River, so it has many hills. And that meant that um, when people had to hide, and they did it both, say, during the Turkish um, siege uh, in the late 17th century, 
And during the German occupation, it was easier to hide there because you could dig from your house directly into the mountain because the houses were built on the, on the slopes of the mountain. Um, uh, another thing that makes it different from some other towns in the region is that the next major town that I mentioned, Chortkov, now called Chortkiv, uh, was a major Hasidic center. Uh, and Buchach was not. So in terms of Jewish history, there's a big difference between them and there was competition between them. But by and large, it's very similar to a whole range of towns that in this region had a mix of Polish, Ukrainian, and Jewish population. Now in terms of violence, um, what, what one has to keep in mind is two things. A, yes, there is a history of violence, and that history of violence is remembered collectively and very differently by different communities over time, and B, most of the time there's no violence there. And it is not a place where people are not safe on the street. Um, um, my sense is that in uh, 1910, walking down the street in Buchach was probably safer than walking down the street in New York. There was, everybody knew everybody. There was no, um, uh, no incidence of crime was something really rare. Um, but uh, that does not mean that it's harmonious because the communities have very strong opinions about each other in Buchach and in the region in general. And those opinions, which become increasingly nationalized, uh, so religion and nationalism start working hand in hand, then create a potential for violence, which is not of this criminal nature, although it becomes that, but has an ideological aspect to it. And that kicks in particularly, as, as I argue, in World War I. So it's from World War I that the, 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 uh, things change dramatically in Buchach and in many, many other uh, uh, towns in this region, um, both because of the violence of the war, which is extremely violent there, and we know, uh, you know, we, we all read stories about the Western Front, that's what uh, most people in the West read, but the war there was extremely violent, and because the war ends with the fall of the empires and the creation of nation states. And these nation states see themselves as nation states burdened with these large minorities, uh, which they want either to integrate or to kick out. Okay. I mean, one thing, it does seem, um, I mean, it, it's not. Uh, rare, right? But I mean, there was the the worst period was at the very end when um, the Germans uh, f first are driven back, but then managed to not at the very end, but in 1944 they managed to to reoccupy this area. Um, is that something where everywhere it happened was was something that um, I mean, you know mm -hmm. people come mm -hmm. out, right? They come mm -hmm. out from hiding, yeah. and then now they're they're vulnerable, and, they, and almost all of them in this case anyway are wiped out. Is that is that a pattern that you've seen? Um, more broadly? Well, the, 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 this case is rather unique uh, in the sense that um, the, the, the Germans are pushed out uh, and then because of the turn of military events, they come back. Uh, what is interesting here is that when they are pushed out, 800, um, no one has the exact figure, so it's somewhere between 600 and 1,000. So let's say 800 Jews who were residents of Buchach come out of hiding. Now, compared to 8,000, that's not uh, uh, so great. But um, compared to survivor rate in general in this region, it's quite extraordinary that so many had survived. Uh, so the first question is, why did so many succeed in surviving in Buchach, unlike other towns? W what was the cause? And different people give different answers. So uh, some people will say, well, it's because there was a Jewish resistance, and the Jewish resistance had intimidated uh, um, Polish and particularly U Ukrainian denouncers, um, uh, Jew hunters, who were denouncing Jews for money to the Germans. And they had tried to assassinate them, they, they killed a couple of them, and so uh, uh, the, the denouncers were intimidated. Uh, another argument is the opposite that in, in Buchach, the relations before the war were better than in many other towns. And it is a fact that when the Germans arrived in uh, early July 1941, there is no massive pogrom in Buchach, and there is in many other towns. It does not happen in Buchach. And it's not that the Ukrainians don't take over. They do, and there is violence, but there is no massive killing. 
So that may be an indication that in that town relations were relatively better than in other towns. Um, but, but that is rather unique. The second aspect of it is, of course, that then the Germans come back. And when, when the Germans come back, all the people came out of hiding. A, they're exhausted. One has to understand they were in hiding. They are malnourished. They, they'd usually been in the holes in the ground. They, they cannot walk. Uh, they're very, very weak, so it's very hard for them to escape. The Soviets who are re retreating tell them, don't worry about it, we'll be back in a, in, a, in, a, in a day or two. And of course, they don't come back between uh, April and July. So, and thirdly, the hiding places are known now. Uh, so it's very easy to hunt them down. Uh, and the, uh, most of them are killed within the, next, the, the, the first few days after the German reoccupation. Uh, so it gives you... Um, a whole variety of um, uh, aspects that are relatively rare. In most cases, once the Germans left, they didn't come back in, in these areas. It was just the, the, the particular uh, um, uh, strange events in that area that, that made that possible. Okay. All right. So. Uh, thank you. Two questions. First of all, when you talk about Galicia in this period of 44 after, I assume the Debrechen counteroffensive, which the Germans launched it, propelled the Red Army back east. What I found extraordinary is these incidents of compassion from the Wehrmacht, because your work, of course, has demolished, uh, been part of demolishing that for the past 25 to 30 years. And so uh, when you look throughout Galicia, what it raised in my mind was what else was going on. I mean, was it just particular to particular units, uh, et cetera? Were there other examples of this? And then the second thing you bring up was Stepan Bandera, who is, you know, put into a concentration camp in July of 1941 by the Germans. But we know what Oun with the splits does and UPA in terms of everything that they do during the war and after the war uh, in terms of anti-Semitism and killing Jews. So go more into that, you know, because uh, this town is not the only town where a Stepan Bandera monument is. There's all throughout Ukraine museums to Stepan Bandera, et cetera, who's killed in 59 by the KGB. So, so that issue of memory you know, being revitalized at Stepan Bandera, who is now the great hero, is, is fascinating. Thank you. Um, the, the first issue, um, look, I mean, um, yes, I was uh, talking about it earlier. I, I did spend um, about tw 20 years uh, saying that the Wehrmacht was, was up to its ears in, uh, in killing and murder, and, and uh, nothing that I found out here uh, will prove otherwise. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, change people's opinions uh, about the conduct of the German armed forces in general. Uh, however, uh, this is what happens when you do a study, a close study of one place. You find that all the truths that, you, that may, be, may hold in general become more complicated. It's just like we generalize about humanity and then we get to know an individual and they don't quite fit our views of how people behave. They have their own original uh, peculiar traits. Um, so in this case, we have uh, two elements that uh, were not only in the case of Buchach. And in fact, uh, um, the case of these few German officers don't relate only to Buchach. It's not happening in, in Buchach. It's just that some survivors of that town benefit from it. It's happening in the eastern part of eastern Galicia. There were agricultural farms that were being run by the Germans uh, and in which um, uh, Jews were working. And it was really the only place where they could still survive because otherwise the area was Judenfrei and they would be shot on site. Uh, and they were good workers. And the, obviously, they worked as hard as they could because it was the only way to survive. Uh, and the, the agricultural officers there uh, create some sort of relationship with them. And this is really what I was interested in seeing. They get to know them. They, they, they don't see them as dehumanized Jews. They see them as people. And they also get particularly angry at these bandits, at these people who raid uh, these farms and kill people, rape people, uh, ask them for money to buy vodka, and they say they, they will not allow that to happen. Uh, 
So whether they're Judenfreudlich, whether they're, they're doing it because they love Jews or because they have a particular relationship with the people that they're working with, or they're really angry at these bandits and hooligans, that's very hard to say. The second category of Germans who help are combat officers who are retreating. Now, many of them, as I've written myself, were brutalized by the war, and you can't expect much good from them. But it so happens that some of them come there, they, have not, they know nothing about the area that they're coming to, and they see these groups of people who are just being hunted down by villagers, by militias, uh, by Vlasov soldiers. There are a lot of soldiers, they call them Vlasov soldiers. It's r former Russian uh, soldiers who were POWs who then served in the German army and have now deserted from the German army and they're also raiding and going wild there and they say we won't let that happen. Uh, I don't think this um, changes the fact that the, the Germans are the organizers of the genocide of the Jews but it does give it a more complex picture and that's really what I'm interested in. The second is a much bigger question about Bandera and, the, and their own. Um, um, look, the, the, the uh, own, which is uh, formed in uh, 1929, uh, and then the own and the UPA, UPA is the, is the Ukrainian insurgent army that is formed in 43. Uh, they are fascist organizations that are dedicated to creating a Ukraine free of Poles and Jews and liberating it from the Bolsheviks. Uh, the, the main enemy, as they see it, are the, are the Soviets, the communists, uh, and they identify Jews with communists, and the Poles. Um, the, the, the first uh, wave of violence is in Volinia, in the province that is north of Galicia, uh, where they, they conduct extraordinarily brutal ethnic cleansing of Poles. Now, they also kill a lot of Jews, but most of the Jews have already been killed by the Germans. So by the time the UN and UPA uh, um, become active uh, um, um, as killers of civilian populations, they're far more opposed to be killed than Jews. Uh, but when there are Jews to kill, they, they participate in that. Many members of these organizations before that had served as German policemen. And they uh, desert en masse from the German police and join the Ukrainian insurgent army in 1943. And they're using often techniques in killing Poles and Jews that they learned from the Germans uh, because they helped them in killing the Jews. Uh, that is an, an extraordinary aspect of the violence there within whose context also the Holocaust happened and is continuing to, happening, to, to happen, the killing of the Jews. Now, after the war, um, the Ukrainian nationalists continued to resist the Soviets uh, well into the late 40s. By the late 40s, most of them are dead. Um, and as, as you mentioned, in, in, in 59, Bandera himself is assassinated. But by then, he's been marginalized by Ukrainian nationalists because he's uh, really a bit of a weirdo. Uh, within the politics of memory in that region, the Soviets... Um, of course, don't allow any talk about those um, uh, uh, Ukrainian freedom fighters as freedom fighters. They talk about them as collaborators with the fascists. Uh, and of course, they don't talk about the Holocaust, but they talk about the killing of innocent Soviet civilians. There's a guidebook to Bucha from 1985 that takes you to the hill on which uh, still, there is a Jewish cemetery, without mentioning that you would be standing in a Jewish cemetery, and on a mass grave of about 4,000 bodies, and, and says, in this town, 8,000 uh, innocent Soviet civilians were killed, and it never mentions Jews. That's from 1985. So that was the Soviet politics of memory. Once independent Ukraine is created in 1991, in Western Ukraine, this is not something that uh, happens in Eastern Ukraine, in Western Ukraine, in those areas, that had come under Russian Soviet rule only in 39 and then in 44. Before that, it was never under Russian rule. Uh, in those areas, suddenly, those people who had been maligned by the Soviets as collaborators with the fascists reappear as national heroes because they fought for Ukrainian independence. And they're linked to um, uh, the, the period of 1919 to the first Ukrainian Republic or Western Ukrainian Republic uh, 
Uh, and that is linked to Khmelnytsky, to the first uprising of the Ukrainians, although there were no Ukrainians then. But reading it backward, it appears like a Ukrainian uprising. And that creates a whole spate of memorials, as you say, everywhere. Buchac, in fact, got its memorial quite late because it's poor. It costs money to build this. So it took them a long time to raise funds to put up this memorial. Now you go to Lviv, there's a huge arc, triumphal arc, and a huge monument to Badera. If you go to eastern Ukraine, people there still speak about the, the Oun and Upa as collaborators. Uh, so there, that's the politics of memory of western Ukraine. Uh, it's still very vibrant, and it's still part of a, an internal discussion in Ukraine about the past and the, and the future nature of that country. Uh, uh, professor, of all of the areas in which local populations collaborated, from the, from the Bal uh, Baltic uh, down all the way to the Black Sea, would you uh, make the argument uh, that the Ukrainians are the most uh, involved with denial about what happened to the Jewish population? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure, you know, there's a, there's a really fantastic uh, book that will be published soon, um, which is about um, um, writing about the Holocaust in post-communist Eastern Europe. And it goes country by country, talking about that. So it's a little hard to make these comparisons. Uh, different countries have dealt with it differently. Um, Poland, as you know, has gone through a great deal of uh, conflict, uh, but by and large uh, has gone a long way toward uh, recognizing not just, um, well, in fact, not particularly Polish complicity, but rather uh, Jewish history as part of Polish history, uh, which maybe is a more important element of, of, of this kind of politics of memory. Um, in Lithuania, uh, there has been a trend toward the right in the last few years. Uh, there was more openness, uh, and now there's less. Um, Ukraine is, 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 uh, is different in, in several ways. Ukraine was part of Soviet Russia in a very different way from the Baltic countries or Poland or Hungary or all of those countries. It was really part of Soviet Russia. And as, as I said earlier, Ukraine itself is somewhat conflicted about where does it belong to, east or west, or Russia, or, um, and then within western Ukraine, uh, there is a particular nationalist strain uh, which calls for glorification of the nationalists who happen to have also been genocidal. It's the same people who fought bravely to liberate Ukraine, and, and in some ways they had a point. But we're also complicit in mass murder. Um, and uh, Ukraine is very poor. So what the Poles can do, or the Lithuanians can do, uh, which is also to allow renovation of synagogues, to have, you don't have that in Western Ukraine. Uh, it's, it's very depressing. Uh, to go there because you see collapsed synagogues, you see cemeteries being used as marketplaces um, or uh, just, just, just used for grazing for the local goats. Um, and part of it is that they, um, they started this process much later on and they are materially um, very backward still. Uh, and they're involved in other policies of memory internal that don't exist in places like Poland and Lithuania where they, they know who they are and, and they can look back at their history and, and make claims that in Ukraine are very difficult to make now. Uh, so, so in that sense, it, in terms of recognizing the past, I think it's, uh, there's a long way to go. Um, um, but you know, I, I would say at the same time, I mean, I know uh, a number of uh, young and not so young Ukrainians who would like very much to change this and who are doing their best. It's very difficult to do now. There is an anti-Semitic discourse in Western Ukraine as there is also in Lithuania. It's very hard to do that. But 
I, I would just be careful about generalizing because I think one has to also work with the positive and there is a positive there and there has been a, um, some sort of tendency to dismiss Ukraine completely and I don't think it serves anyone's interest to just say well the Ukrainians forget about it. Uh, there is work to be done there and I think it can be done and I think it should be encouraged. Okay, so this is a broader question, but can you explain the dehumanization argument as you understand it? And then does it operate at some level above the local level, say strategically? And then can you exp like give a few examples in your research that undermines this argument, the most prominent ones? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I, years ago when I started thinking about this project, this was the main question that, that, that interested me. Uh, because I, I went on a tour, I visited some seminars in Germany that were, were friends, colleagues were, were teaching courses on the Holocaust and I was interested, how, how is that done in Germany? And this is uh, 15, 17 years ago. Uh, and um, the courses were really interesting and the students were very dedicated and they read a lot and they read only material about the perpetrators. They read no memoirs, they read nothing about Jews, they read only about Germans. And when I asked them why, they said, well, because we need to know why we, our ancestors, did that. That's what we want to know. I said, yes, but genocide is a two-sided thing. I mean, the, the people kill and the, the people get killed. And, and, and what about them? They said, well, for them they didn't exist. For the killers, the Jews didn't exist. They dehumanized them. So, and in a sense, they accepted that argument. And I thought that once, when you write about genocide, or about war for that matter, about any violence, and you write about it only for one side, you, are, you become complicit because you see things only through that perspective. Uh, and I said, A, I don't think that's really good history, and B, I don't believe it's true. I don't think it, it, it did happen, it can happen, but it doesn't consistently happen, and it's not that dehumanization is the, is the answer that you dehumanize a group and then what's the problem? You just kill them. Because you still have to come to a, to a child and shoot them in the head. And the brain still spatter. So, um, this was the question for me and it's a general question. It's a question about human psychology. It's a question about um, um, uh, violence in general and it's a question about genocide and about the Holocaust. And it was particularly prominent in speaking about the Holocaust and especially in Germany for reasons that we don't have to go into further than what I said. Now, um, my, my sense is that when you look at violence um, more closely, you will often find other types of um, 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 interaction between the killer and the killed. And what I found, when I started doing this research, I just wanted to see what was the relationship between the, the killers and the killed, right? But what I found was that intimacy, an intimate relationship creates, can create proximity, closeness, compassion, and can create uh, particularly gruesome violence. And I think that in part I was influenced when I started thinking about it also by events that were happening at the time in Bosnia and Rwanda where you see gratuitous violence. It's not just that you go and kill your neighbors. You rape them, you, you torture them, you kill the children in front of the parents. Why, why do you have to do those things? That's, that's often part of genocide, but why? And that has to do, as I started thinking about it, precisely with the fact that you know them. So it's not just that it's easier to kill when you dehumanize. It's when you know people, the nature of the killing is different. And, it's, and, and that you can see again and again in many genocides. Now in the Holocaust, we, I, I actually used that term in a, in a book I wrote, Industrial Killing. So we, we tend to talk about industrial killing and it is a unique aspect of the Holocaust in terms, if you compare it to other genocides. But as I said, much of it didn't happen that way 
Much of it happened very intimately. And so, if you want examples of that, um, uh, for me, the, the most striking examples are of people, and, and I have several of those in, in my own materials, who were both killing and keeping other potential victims in their home and protecting them. And, it's, and this is not only in Buchach. I mean, I know one case, in fact, it's a colleague now uh, whose, whose mother was saved by an SS officer who was involved in killing. Um, so how do you explain that? Where does dehumanization come in here? Now, you asked about the general thing, yes. The general thing is crucial. If you want to identify where genocide is going to happen, the first thing you have to look for is that in a, in a, in a nation, in a state, in a society, you speak about one group as less than human. Once you use that terminology, it doesn't mean that genocide will happen, but that's the first step. You, you simply distance those people. You say, okay, they are, they're, they're not like us. They are cockroaches, they are, they are parasites, they are worms, they are something else, but they are not fully human. Um, but as I say, that's not the end of the story. That's only the beginning. All right, well, thank you so much, Omer. And, and please, uh, let's all join in, in thanking him. Really thank you.